You good? You okay? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. It's a sunny day, warm day, and it's the second day the guys get to train today. So it was nice to see the field, even though we can't, we don't really coach, but nice to see the players from far and uh, and uh, get back into the soccer world. Yeah, we're we're seeing the pictures. Obviously, it's great to see with the professional pictures and these, you know, the stage one or stage two, whatever it is. What what does a coach do? Do you sit in an office or do you stand in the parking lot or where do you stand when this goes on? No, actually, uh, the way where our training facility is set up, there is a media uh, tower where mm -hmm. usually uh, the media comes because I know uh, in Europe and the rest of the places usually media is not has doesn't have access to training facility, but here media uh, is part of the the whole picture. Uh, so uh, us coaches, one at a time, we uh, we go. Uh, and watch the players go through their individual trains from the tower and uh, oversee, if you can say. And then uh, what, uh, we rotate so that, because uh, they want less people possible. possible. Mm -hmm. So since we don't really have any functions per se, is to go there and support and watch and observe. And also from far, still have contact with the players that we didn't have for, uh, for quite some time now. Yeah, brilliant. Must feel good just to be around people again. Yeah, yeah. I'm lucky because around my neighborhood, I get to see people, but get back into the surroundings, the training facility, the field, seeing the players, uh, you know, every and different cultures and everything. It's just, yeah, it's just people like you were seeing every day. Suddenly you, you haven't seen in uh, around 10 weeks, if it's not just from uh, using the internet and all the, the videos that we have, but lively being there. Yeah, it was, it's nice to, uh, to reconnect even though it has the, we still have the distancing. It's still nice to to be at the facility and feel that we're we're part of the football world again, and we're starting to relive and uh, and start all, uh, start again. Mm, brilliant, brilliant. Okay, well, hey, appreciate you joining us today. Um, I've got a few questions for you, and then we'll we'll take a few from the audience, and we'll try and know you're a busy man, so we won't Perfect. keep you long. So, if that works with you, um, yes, of course, of course. Brilliant, brilliant. Um, my first question, I was just telling the coaches there that. I'm intrigued to hear a lot of coaches who watch hockey, ice hockey, and are obviously see a lot of similarities between coaching the game and how the game's played. And uh, never spoke at a high level to someone who's played both at a particularly high level. So, where, where, where does it influence you as a coach? As a coach, a good question because I've kind of left uh, ice hockey for quite some time. I watch it from afar, but still, uh, now when you're coaching, the thing is when you do other sports. Because now, since I stopped playing soccer and football, I came back to an old flame, which is hockey. And when you're playing, you start seeing things as a coach. Mm, how can I integrate this into? Because this fit into because the hockey is about five a side pretty much, mm. it's a short, it's a, it's an arena a rink very small, it's dynamic. So when I look at it, I go man, there's a lot of contact, and the very good players, what do they do in hockey? Like a, a Sidney Crosby that I consider as a great hockey IQ. Uh, I grew up with Wayne Gretzky back in the day. So how what do these players like? How do they not go into contact? So I, I look at all these uh, small details. And after that, yeah, the, the dynamics of hockey, it's so fast paced, so demanding. So I also relate to, okay, we tell our soccer players, mm, you know, repeating the efforts is difficult. While in hockey, they're able to do it for 45 seconds to a, one minute. So, and I lived it uh, having been a player myself. So how can I, or can I bring a little bit that mindset saying, yeah, you gotta be able to live in that threshold which is the red zone, but a little bit longer because if you can do it one or two more times than the other, that means it's a chance for you to beat your opponent, a chance for you to be, uh, to be able to still be fresh and focused, even though there's fatigue. Uh, and hockey is so quick that also it's the, the awareness. We always say have your head on the swivel and hockey, uh, you have to have one because it's there's the physical aspect where you, there's contact and there's uh, body checks. And a hockey player has to be able to see what's going forth in front of him, but what's coming on sideways, right? Looking at the, the, the puck and seeing if there's not another player there who's there to, uh, to hit him or seeing the next play. So, uh, so uh, all these things, when you look at it in the hockey, it's, uh, it's interesting 
to look at these dynamics and say, okay, this is something in fiber side, but it's also in soccer. How can I? Uh, I know I used it because it helped me a lot, but uh, also how can I take that and implement it and also talk to players saying, look, a hockey player can do it in 45 seconds to a minute. Why couldn't a soccer player do it uh, also? Because yes, we, we train on a 90 minute, but uh, uh, we play on a 90 minutes, but can we push the threshold of working in anaerobic phase a little bit longer because there are other sports that are able to manage it longer, even though they're different. Mm. You, your interview, just going, you, you mentioned there about the standing at the tire, the media tire and, and the facility watching. I'm sure, sure it's a beautiful facility uh, in comparison to your experiences growing up. Your interview in the Players' Tribune, you spoke about uh, the converted hockey rinks with coke all over the floor. Yeah. Do, do you think today there's a danger in the elite sport that conditions and facilities are almost too perfect for young players? Uh, yeah, it's a good question because sometimes I think about it. I go, I'm happy because it says football has progressed that we, especially here in Canada, we, we have soccer specific areas that allow kids to train all year long, no matter the winter. Uh, but at the same time, I go, I remember I played in different arenas, different uh, facilities that uh, tested me. Uh, we had to play in small gymnasiums before futsal was even a word that we really knew here in Canada. But I had to play in small areas with the walls, uh, different types of balls, uh, working your small sided games. How do you come out of tight situations? And like you mentioned, we had to play in hockey arenas sometimes in the spring because there weren't that many soccer fields or they weren't ready in the spring yet. And I had to work with boards. Uh, soccer soccer arena uh, exists around here. So I go, okay, it's great that they have all these facilities so they're learning soccer the proper way quicker. But uh, are they still playing in the streets? Are they playing in other environments that trigger different things? Uh, I, I would say creativity uh, allows you to think differently. Uh, so... Uh, I think those are things that now people are paying attention to. Should we change in a program that kids go do something else or go play in another environment so that they're challenged differently? Because just take example, futsal, and there's a lot of uh, five-a-side facilities being built here. They're interesting because it's so quick, dynamic. You have to protect the ball, and you're always consistently in the action. So you have to be self-aware. Those things help. Well, you can put it on the field as much as you want want but it's not the same and it helps i think the players grow technically physically in all different aspects of the of a soccer soccer player mm. you need that ad adversity and that adversity comes in different ways i mean how, how much was your obviously growing up wasn't perfect facilities either but how much adversity did you face when you made the jump to europe uh, yeah, it was interesting because uh, even though I had been part of the national team program as a young player, you get to get out of the country, but you always come back. And being in North America, you kind of go South America, Central America, the USA, Mexico. Uh, so you see these parts of the world more often, so you're accustomed. But now I was going across the Atlantic, uh, going to Scandinavia. And back then, there wasn't the internet. You couldn't go and Google places and say, okay, this is how it is, this the, the population of the place, language, Google Translate. I kind of went out there and going, okay, uh, are they going to understand me? Because I speak English, speak French, but I don't know if uh, Norwegians actually speak English. Uh, there probably won't will be one or two, but I, I have no clue. Uh, do they train indoors? Because to be honest, Canada, I, I always train indoors. I never really train. Once October, November came, you didn't go outside. And I know they have the same climate. So culturally, language, and then after that, it's full, just football uh, tactics and culture because as much as we, we, I saw a bit of soccer, which usually was World Cup or Champions League, so Norwegian League was, uh, was something far. I didn't really know, uh, except for the Norwegian national team, I didn't really know much. So I went there open-minded and uh, just tried to prove myself and performing and also adjusting quickly. I think the, the greatest word is adaptability adjusted for a player on the field but also as a person to uh, to because now my family was thousands of kilometers away and uh i couldn't just go bad performance okay let me go home back with parents sisters everybody that could cuddle you now it was like 
you know, the next day you have to find a way to perform better in training to be on the starting 11 and, and all those things, uh, they were a challenge uh, as much as the off and on the field. Uh, and then learning Norwegian football pretty much the way they do things because I grew up a certain way in Canada and in, uh, in Quebec. And then I was, I had to adapt to their style of football and try to perform and just show who I was as a player and fit into the mold of a team and, and this new uh, uh, football world. Mm. Fascinating comment that you made in that interview again at the Tribune where you said, my mistake in Germany was that I settled. I thought I had arrived, that I made it when I should have been trying to improve, pushing myself towards the league, towards the top league. Wanted to get your thoughts, knowing this now, and from a coaching perspective, would there be anything a coach could have done to help push or help you realise what you were going through? Oh, at the time, which was because I was going for the Norwegian League and I got married and uh, with the national team, I just had a great summer. So, and I didn't really have a break to tell myself, okay, how do I prepare to go to Germany? I went from playing in Norway to national team straight to Germany and getting married. So everything that was kind of on a high and, uh, and you're like, okay, now I'm going to the next step. So that means I'm good. But to prepare yourself, usually uh, before I would have taken off, uh, off season is, Okay, prepare the body. Uh, you're telling yourself this is going to be even more difficult because you're playing in Germany. I went to FC Kaiserslautern. It's not a small club. Mm. Uh, and then so you, you get time to prepare yourself and, and re-attack the new, new, uh, the new project, the new challenge. But I just stepped in and was starting to play. And things went well. But uh, going from Norway, things always went well. And then you go into Germany where it's different types of players, different culture, uh, higher demand. The, the club itself and the fans also are a lot more, uh, it's no disrespect, no way people res uh, follow soccer and very, uh, very, very big uh, fans of soccer there and the population. But now Germany is another, another world. You're playing in front of 50,000 people. Uh, I don't know because then at the time, the coach at the time was arriving from Norway. So he... He knew me from the as a Norwegian player, but me was now settling in. And like I said, I was on a high, so I kind of like settled, got a little bit too comfortable instead of telling myself, hey, I'm here, but I want to go to, I was Bundesliga, Bundesliga too. I want to go to Bundesliga. If the club gets there, great. That's my, uh, that's the, the objective, but I also want to get there too. And I kind of got into a cushion and uh, it started off well, but then the minute it went a little bit uh, sour, that's where I wasn't able to get back. Maybe it's the fact that the team wasn't doing so well, but also I could have looked at, could have done more to push myself and be able to push my teammates more to, to uh, turn, turn the, the, the locomotive around so that the team could do better and I could keep performing. And then injuries set in and that's where you realize, man, had I pre prepared better, probably I wouldn't have the injury. Probably I would have been able to maintain performances and, uh, and showcase yourself and, and keep going where I wanted to go, which was uh, in the top league, even though I was in the top country. Mm. I had obviously with Jesse Marsh on yesterday, and he said something I thought was, was really powerful. He said that development was not just for young players. He talked about Bradley Wright Phillips at the Red Bulls and how he bought into getting better still later on in his career. Do you think from a coaching community, we... We probably do overemphasize youth and development when really we should, if we want to keep, you know, professional players getting better, there should be a bit more awareness. Yeah, because the thing is, uh, we, we tell ourselves that experienced players know it all. And maybe it's because they're older, we, we tend to go, I don't want to bother, He's, he already has 10 years of experience. But it's a mindset first and foremost, and you're trying to build it for the young players to know what it takes to become a professional and to maintain a, uh, your job, to have a career. But also it's to challenge the players who maybe did very well for quite some time and need new challenges. Uh, the funny thing is, as we have watched, I don't know if everybody watched the last dance with Michael Jordan, you kept seeing that he kept challenging himself. And probably also he had Phil Jackson who knew how to to give or take, uh, and, and, and it's an experienced player. You're not talking about the rookie player that came into the league. You're talking about Michael Jordan. So it's, it's uh, like uh, Jesse Marsh, because I had him also in, uh, 
Oh, yeah. And, uh, in, in Montreal in 2012, he was part of the first year of the, the franchise in MLS. And it's to buy into the philosophy, the ideas. And when you're in there, then, easy, then it's easier for your older players to kind of do the coaching for you because now they're coaching the younger players. So it's important to, 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 to have your ideas and to be very clear cut with the, the players and also push those players to say, hey, you may be here, but you can still get better. Even if it's a 1%, it's still get better. And like you said, Barry Life Phillips ended up being one of the premier star strikers and still is in, uh, in MLS coming from Europe himself and uh, establishing a standard and being able to do it. He's scored 15 or 20 goals year in, year out. So it just shows that it's not just young players that you have to carry. It's also how do you, how do you motivate a, a player who's played 10 years, who's seen a lot of football, but can he see more? Even uh, we had DJ Drogba, we had Marco Di Vaio, we had Alessandro Nesta. It's not easy to, uh, to cater to them, uh, but you, you have to find a way to ignite each and every player. So uh, that's what I love about football now is we tend to look more into personalities now, how to learn the player and the person more than just the confine, confound of the group to be able to push the guys who are at the top so that they push the rest of the group and pardon the younger players so that they also see, say, oh, I, I still have uh, ways to go before I get to what he's, he's reached because a lot of times what happens, young players get in and now they, they're side by side with a guy who's played 15 years and they, they, they assume that, oh, I've made it. And it's not the case. It's every day is a new challenge and you, you've made it once you've finished your career. Mm. Trump was a great point. He had a very late development from when he went from Marseille to Chelsea. It was, I'm guessing, like 26, 27. I mean, how, how did he conduct himself on a daily basis when you when you work with him? Ah, uh, DJ for me is fantastic. It was great to have him. Not just the football, because of course we know he played at Chelsea, he played at World Cups, played at Champions League. But I think the human being had an attitude, had a mindset, and talking with him. He admitted himself. He said, "I was a late, uh, a, a late addition to high-level football. I went from Marseille, where I did well for a year, year and a half, and then boom, I went to Chelsea. And at the beginning, if you, if everybody re re remembers, it wasn't as easy the first few times, uh, first few matches or months in, in Chelsea. But he was committed, and he paid attention to what others were doing uh, and and what he wanted to improve himself because he saw that." Now it was with Chelsea, but the players next to me are all internationals. So if I want to maintain my position, I have to do a little bit more. And and, uh, and when we got him here in Montreal, even though he was at the end of his career or towards the end of his career, every day he came in and always said, you can do more. You know, carry players with him. You know, let's do some finishing. Come with me. Let's go. Uh, so those are things that you you notice. You go, wait, he's he's won almost everything. You know, he's gone to the highest level that a player wants to achieve and he still wants more. So that's where you realize the mindset, the attitude. And then after that, it leads to the behavior and then it's contagious because people tend to follow. Brilliant. Which coach made the biggest impact on you as a player and why? Oh, good question. Those questions, I always say coaches always impact you. Even the ones that maybe tactically you didn't necessarily, it was all breaking, but you learn because they push you physically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny, I just had a conversation with Thierry Henry, which we were talking about this, and, it, and it's, I had some coaches that pushed me a lot physically because I played hockey, played soccer, so I always felt I was fit, but I had a coach who pushed me, and I realized mentally, this was Paul James on the under-20 national team. Uh, tactically, I don't think uh, I could say I learned uh, uh, things that I kept, but mentally and my physical demands, I learned a lot from him. Bob Lilly, when I was at Montreal Impact in the USL days, in my A League, my first professional days, he was very astute on tac tactical stuff. And in North America, tactical stuff were like, trains can't last two hours. We got to play, we got to train. We, we just know we're going to beat the other team. Now, he was really paying attention to how we're going to play, how we're going to defend. And and, uh, and and so that helped me a lot to my transition to Europe because then I arrived there and it was kind of a chess game. 
And uh, the coach that I, I, that marked me the most over there was uh, Per Matthias Hogmo in, uh, in Norway. But him, it was for a different uh, aspect. It's because there's so much pressure into the game and you're always thinking, I got to prepare myself, headphones, music, focused. And uh, he always had before games, a lecture. One player would go to in front of the group and read about a book or an article, something that uh, touched you profoundly or just uh, marked you. And I, at first, you're uncomfortable because you're going to talk about or amongst your peers about a book. You don't know if you're going to like it or not. And then you realize, but those 15 minutes, the players don't think about the game. And this is before a game. These players listen or your divulging part of your your, your story or something that you liked and and you're not thinking about the game and then when you realize then when you refocus about the game you're fresh and you're thinking and you're you're uh, and we had good a good period of time and that's something I, that i always kept where we're so focused in videos and everything but at one point the brain also needs to it's a muscle too just like the rest of the body that needs to stay fresh so that when you go into the game you're You're, you're, you're concentrating on your task at hand, and then you're not saturated of thinking of the game too much, and then you've played the game before you actually played it. Oh, so that's a so those, those were the three coaches. Yeah, interesting. I, um, I heard uh, Sean Dyche talking this morning on a podcast, and he was talking about Dick Bate, and he said that when Dick Bate talked, he brought him into Burnley a few times, and when he talked to his group, He would always make a mistake deliberately so the player had to correct him. And then the player knew then, you know, the player was the pen and it just took the attention. I'm thinking, that's just on a level. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah the, the people out there will really think uh, mm. of all these aspects because we're thinking so much of the game. Mm. Sometimes you realize, how can I deconnect him or concentrate on something else which will help to be fresh-minded and, uh, and, uh, and focused and prepared because we now that we're much more cognitive we think so much of how do we teach them for the brain to think but the brain also gets tired and can be uh, condensed how come you didn't perform ah i was thinking so much that i didn't play do you do you think then from a north american culture like certainly in the u.s that you the preparation now has probably moved from a lot more insular people have the headphones in people are in their corners so when you're saying that the player might be thinking a staff might be thinking that they're disconnected because everyone's doing their own thing so they look to bring them back together when really they should be trying to loosen that a little bit is that what they thought yeah about? because what happens you've done your work normally monday to friday you've done your work you've put the videos you've talked about the opponent you put your ideas the guys have worked And then game day, they have to perform. You know, the coach is there, yes, to guide and to, to talk about the points that you refresh, the points that we've talked the whole week. But then the players, they have to be ready to prepare. And, and that's the thing is I remember back in the day, people were like, ah, take away the headphones, you know. And then you're, then you're, you're focused on the game. You're not focused on something that the coach wants to talk to you directly. And then, and then you're kind of like a bit intertwined in, in between, in a gray zone, while players – I know as a player, I was like, I'm in the zone. I know what I got to do. Now, it's my job to go and execute it. Then it's the coach's job to redirect if you're not doing it or tell you after the game, hey, you, weren't, you, didn't, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. But the players, you gave them the information. Now the test is Saturday. And the players have to, you, like a test, the teacher doesn't come and go, hey, yeah, look here, you got to prepare for this question. No, they got to go and answer it themselves because you normally, if you did your job well, You should you should lead them to be autonomous and be able to can't say uh, uh, correct errors during a game because it goes so fast. But you should, they should have the process and everything in, in mind, the ideas, and and put it out there and let their football speak through the ideas of the coach. Fantastic. Um, yeah, let's talk about you as a coach now. The last few. I mean, what, how would you describe yourself? Very basic question. Oh, funny. I'm still the. I think kind of discovering because I'm still a very young coach, even though I, I, I played for quite some time. Uh, I'm more of a, I like players to think about the game. I, the thing is you realize everybody comes from different cultures, different backgrounds, so not everybody thinks like what you see in your head, but it's trying to put the ideas 
And one thing I try to notice, and I've got a great uh, uh, phrase from my former coach, Mauro Biello, one of my, uh, my last coach as a player. He told me, uh, don't become the player. And I was trying to, and then he explained to me, and he says, because sometimes when you're a coach, you go, you should have done that because that's you, the for, former player, saying, I would have done that, but you're not that player anymore. You're not the person you're talking to because uh, I'm Patrice Bernier, but that person is another player and maybe sees things differently on the field. So how do you guide them to have, see the options and then take the one they be, believe the best? Uh, so that's the part of letting go and maybe letting the player make the mistakes. Uh, and then after that, maybe talking to the player and asking what did he see uh, and uh, did he see the other options and, and, and letting him figure it out. Because uh, I always like the coaches that challenge you in those sense without telling you the answer is so that you start thinking, mm, he's asking me something. I don't know the answer, but I got to find it. And, and then guiding the player. So I would say I, I would become a coach that uh, tries to put his ideas in place, but let's go a bit because I realize as a player, I, I, I didn't like when people talk too much to command me or guide, uh, uh, direct me. So I don't want to become that coach. But it's going to be difficult because... You don't have the control as, as when you were a player. So uh, there's all the emotions that come in as a coach where you see it and you, but you can't execute it. You're not the player. So I'll uh, manage, have to manage my emotions. But I'd see how I'd like to be somebody who lets the players uh, uh, do their thing, but guide them throughout the week. And uh, I like the one-on-one -on -one, uh, relations to be able to talk. And, and uh, maybe it's the part when I was a captain, but I like that relation where you talk football and you try to see what's in their heads or how they're thinking and uh, and try to guide them to 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 uh to be a think more or or, or think more of the options if i should say mm. we talked about the development there with the older players and the fact that you've worked with the the cat or the youth the younger players at montreal have you naturally gravitated towards the younger players to try and uh develop them into full-time pros has that been a natural progression for you yeah as i was um when the coach the i mean the club approached me i was at the academy so the way i saw it was a lot of times the young players we say okay welcome to the pros and we kind of hope that they learn through the jungle mm -hmm. but we forget that their development stage still continues they're learning to be professionals there and to to to, to work towards uh, their peers that are already seasoned and the competitive part of that. So my part was to uh, come in and help those young players keep progressing. And sometimes you have downs because when you were a young player, you perform, you got there being better than the rest. And now sometimes you don't get the minutes, you don't get on the bench. Uh, and it's working with the, the, the mental part of it because now they're living through different stages of their progression which is i always played it gravitated allowed me to become a pro but now i'm part of the team but i'm not as successful as when i was a uh, in the youth department so it's to help them there uh, so it, uh, it's easier for me to gravitate to, but i also gravitate towards the older players but then you're just trying to bring in one or two details because they're seasoned and you just want them to pay attention to certain things but i look more with, with the younger players that either will sign or have signed so that their progression is not stopped and they don't feel that they've just been left uh, left to uh, uh, left to figure it out by themselves when it's sometimes uh, very difficult it had been difficult for me uh, luckily i played but not everybody gets to play right away and and there's ups and downs so that's the part that i transition to as myself and it helps me as a coach also transition to be a better coach in the future mm -hmm. brilliant what you're if we're looking at developing a professional player and you mentioned and we've all we talk about it so often these the things that aren't related to actually soccer the work ethic the grit the determination the desire what do you think or what's your advice for coaches that are working at say u12 u14 before they get to the competitive age what, what can they add to their environment that can trigger these actions or maybe just start to ingrain these behaviors that can be helpful, that can be crucial at, at your level? Uh, I think, yeah, it's a question of the academy because how do you create the competitive player? But I think 
the human nature we are competitive now it's different levels some are are uh, ignited by small details they want to win every game even if it's cards uh, others it's they see it as a game and and slowly inside of it they they they, they progress to becoming a, a bigger competitor then you have to know your players i would say the part that's always interesting is play games always put a competition in there even if it's fun competition it's competition anyway even if it's just okay one line against the other you think it's just okay playing but it's competition players uh, always like those aspects and one thing i've tested is with my kids they're different in the way they, they approach things but the minute you say who's going to be the first or you don't necessarily have to do it but you put in the game concept and with competition they ignite they, they want to push themselves a bit more and then you end up having a little bit more and you trigger their drive because they don't have the same drive uh, at the same exact time of their life they are not the same personalities but at least you're you're putting that in there uh, putting an ingredient, if you can say, in there, to, so that the, the the great recipe at the end comes up, and they're all different. So uh, I always told my thought that the people that are most driven when they're younger end up going, but not necessarily. Some of them are too driven, hit a wall, and some that were less started getting the that pursuit of more later, and that helped them grow to be a have career. So I'd say games, competition, because I come back to it. Human nature, we are all competitive. And so when there's that aspect, everybody, once you put the game, when it's a little passing drill with nothing, but the minute you say, hey, first team to 10, suddenly you just see how everybody ignites a bit more. Mm -hmm. And then it's how they control the emotions. That, that's the part where you, as coaches, you have to be able to gauge more is the ones that are higher emotions to let them come back down and the ones that are maybe lower, let them express themselves and 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 uh, and be competitive even more. So for me, I would say competition, putting games in there, even if it's finishing the game, finishing training with a small five-minute game. You, you, I, uh, I, one thing I noticed is when you put a game, people tend to go, "How was training? The game. I love yeah. the game. The game. The competition. Yeah. It's usually the heavy the players, no matter if they're under twelve or they're pros. That's the part that usually the they, they stay and I remember you, you put a game in training I would say oh yeah I love that game we played we had fun you won you lost but at least it's it's competitive mm. going away from the, the game over here and MLS you know experiencing it over a massive period of growth I mean wh wh where do you think of the biggest uh, in your experience where have the biggest aspects of that growth occurred uh, of course, we know the league has grown in terms of uh, media, publicity, uh, uh, being talked about. I think David Beckham, TRI, they, they, they came as players, but they also came as uh, ambassadors. So it helped out. We got to go get the DJ Drogba's, Pirlo's, Lampard's. But now, I would say uh, from the time I finished till now, tactics. Mm -hmm. I think you, you clearly now clubs have an identity. Uh, some are more... We're going to play young players. We're going to be youth development. We're going to try to sell. Others are more, we're going to invest a bit more. We want we want to win right away, even though everyone wants to win. We all know. Uh, and But in the tactics, you can see now, you, you can say this team plays this way. Uh, this team plays that way. Uh, you can really uh, uh, assess towards the coaches, the style of play. Uh, before, sometimes you didn't. It was the talent was there, but you couldn't really say this is the way they play. It's just if the talent decided that game they, they, they change things mm -hmm. so tactically it's improved uh say now you see game before it was a lot of high press it could get sporadic in north and north south and now you see teams having more compact blocks defensively waiting and pressing at the right time so those are the things that i saw develop towards the end of my time as a player and i see even more now as, as coaches and also you could say other coaches have come in and implemented like uh, Tata Martino in, mm -hmm. in Atlanta, and Patrick Vieira in New York City, and there's other coaches, Bob Bradley, who's in LAFC, and you have Thierry now, Thierry Henry now in Montreal, who is, is a great mind who I think will be able to implement stuff. Uh, so you can pinpoint now teams to coaches, which means that their style of play is, is set, and you can observe it correctly as a fan or as a player or as a coach. Mm. 
a lot of people excited to see you guys next year to see or this year sorry to see how that's going to look how this like i said i i completely see the different types of tactical uh, frameworks that are being set up um everyone's excited to see what you guys are going to be about um last one for you from me would be your inspiration your personal inspiration as you journey now into the coaching aspect is there is it there's books is there leading or listening is there is there an area that you're you're drawing your sources from uh i've always been an fc barcelona fan so i gotta go with pep guardiola <laughs> but i wouldn't say just because guardiola has that i'm exactly like the same because i think yeah. i have the north american mentality which is to go be vertical to try to go to goal uh so but then uh the thing i've noticed is you start taking from each coach you start reflecting back on the coach that you had things that they did that you liked that you implement in your training or in your the culture you want to bring into your club so uh there's a lot of coaches but uh you know just being with Thierry he's played a high level he thinks the game chatting with him he has the uh, different perspective and uh, you see the coaches that he where he's influenced so one per se I would no not necessarily I just like now reading about a lot of stuff. Uh, but the part that I like the most is, as I mentioned for you players, is uh, putting a game, uh, putting a game inside the training. Because I know uh, a lot of coaches like to train uh, 10 v 10 because that seems to be the norm now. Uh, re replicate the game as much as possible, but the 11 inside. But I feel that the game is so collective that it's the, it's the smaller side play, playing that uh, that that's interesting because the game is now defined by small intricate proper parts of 4v4 4v2 uh, 5v4 3v4 and so those are the parts that i like uh, that uh, i think it's you might you your micro part of the soccer now is in the 1v1s i think we there's not so much 1v1s but everything is a 1v1 mm -hmm. uh, how you uh, defend how you attack uh, how you just going to uh, shim your your your, your, your the, the the defender opponent to get to the ball uh, to get free or to create space for somebody else so those are the parts that i i like about um, the soccer that i'm dissecting it more to the game part but uh, the individual or the 2v2s or 3v3s because i think those are the ones that are going to make the difference because the game is so condensed and there's so much tactics there with new new uh, uh, new ways of putting formations uh, animations and it's all going to come out to the player being autonomous and being able to come out of a one-on-one -on -one -on -one against his opponent with the ball or without the ball. Brilliant. Brilliant. Of course, class. Patrice, I love this. This was fantastic. I, I really appreciate oh, you giving up your time. Thanks. appreciate for having you on your show. I uh, listen to it once in a while also, so it's always uh, great to hear different perspectives. I think that's the great thing about football is there's no real one recipe it's just the one that you think is the best that goes with your convictions brilliant uh, very very well put well hey um well, good luck with with getting everything going again and and we'll look forward to seeing you guys on the pitch very very soon and uh we'll hopefully get you on here in the near future and discuss it no thanks thanks yeah it's happy to get back on the field just the smell of the grass is already uh, wow. one thing and now uh, hopefully we get back to uh normal training and, uh, and great games in the future and as i see bundesliga has started so the football world is okay reading again and uh, now it's just igniting the rest of the fire and putting the, the the rest of the wood so that the fire keeps growing for the for the love of football love it love it patrice thanks so much take care we'll talk soon thanks